It is 10 a.m. on Thursday, December 17th, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this uh, informational briefing of the House Committee on Higher Education and Technology, which is being uh, brought to you via the technology of Zoom and being seen on Facebook. I'm Representative Greg Takayama, um, Chair of the uh, House Committee. Uh, the purpose is to inform the public and legislators of how um, the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting the University of Hawaii's 50,000 students and faculty, as well as our researchers, and also how UH is responding to the need for severe reductions in its budget. Now, before turning it over to our first speaker, uh, President Lasner, I'd like to recognize and thank uh, Representative Justin Woodson, Chair of the House Education Committee, which formerly had jurisdiction over higher education for laying a, a solid groundwork for our legislative efforts going forward. Now, we have uh, four presenters this morning for the first half hour, starting with, as I mentioned, Pres President David Lasner. And I want to mention, to, I want to let everyone know that we will have to be stopping this briefing at 1130. And so we've asked our four presenters to abide by certain time limits. Following that, um, we will proceed to questions from our members. So with that, I will turn it over to President Lasner. And, and let me mention before anyone asks that this presentation will be made available to uh, members of the committee um, following this briefing. Uh, President Lasner, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Vice Chair DeCoit, members of the committee and other legislators uh, present. As uh, Chair Takayama mentioned, um, I'll start with a presentation and then we have the Chair of the Board of Regents, uh, one of our faculty leaders and one of our student leaders. Um, so let me begin by sharing my screen. And let's see if this works. Okay, do you see the slides? Yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, so we really wanted to focus this morning on um, COVID and its impact, including but not limited to financial, as um, the chair mentioned. So let me go back in time just a bit to when um, COVID-19 hit. Um, and I won't read all of the slides, but as you can see, um, UH pivoted immediately online. I do wanna highlight some of the expertise across UH that helped then and continues to help. Um, we had um, uh, faculty and students creating masks, shields, doing ventilator innova innovation, trying to develop vaccines, contact tracing training and so forth. And that continues now as UH is integrally involved in the uh, vaccination effort for the entire state. We also volunteered throughout the community uh, with food, sewing masks for community members, um, uh, participating in contact tracing as well, and um, actively engaged, including in the unemployment uh, volunteer effort at the convention center. Our foundation created a fund and we raised over a million dollars that was given uh, directly to students and uh, in particular, our community colleges and P20 program created the next steps to the future for the high school class of 2020 who lost the last part of their year, pretty much the entire quarter. Uh, we offered them free counseling, free courses on guidance, and we also offered them free community college courses. Um, as we prepare to come back, uh, beginning with um, summer school classes in a hybridized environment and then into the fall, we developed a set of guidelines. Uh, Vice President Govea, who's on, was our lead for this. And, and this just highlights some of the things that um, we did, as did many institutions that uh, uh, plan to function during the pandemic. Uh, much of this was done with CARES funds. Uh, we had people working hard all summer to prepare uh, for the fall as well. Uh, following all CDC, state, and county guidelines. Uh, continuing learning has been paramount for us. We wanted to make sure 
we could continue to get our students through the semester and keep them on track to graduation. Um, you can see from this that we took a number of measures to physically distance our classrooms, again, following all applicable guidance, sanitation provisions, um, signage as well. Um, we also um, implemented an app for health checking each day. Vice President Yoshimi was on point uh, for that project as well. This gives you a sense of what learning looks like in the COVID era now. Um, so if you look at what fall 19 looked like in the top um, pie chart, we were mostly in person. And if you look at where we are now, we are mostly online. We expect spring to look much like fall does now. Um, we are not uh, under the illusion that everything will be fine come January. Uh, we are very optimistic that by fall, we will have a healthy mix of uh, in-person, hybrid, and online. Uh, again, uh, Vice President Yoshimi and his team were very busy over the summer to take care of these um, technology initiatives uh, that you see. And we also invested heavily in uh, faculty development over the summer. Um, Associate Vice President Hei Moto is also on if you have questions about those activities. One of our biggest challenges has been student housing. Um, we made the decision to keep student housing open through the spring and continue in part because for many of our students, being on campus is safer than the homes they have left behind. Um, we are heavily distanced. We have student residence halls at both UH Manoa and UH Hilo. And again, special rules, uh, active social and physical distancing, and uh, we de-densified very heavily, which created a financial challenge. And we also uh, made special travel provisions uh, this was before the Safe Travels program, so we worked with Department of Health, Hyema, and others to put all of that into place. Uh, what I found in talking about uh, what UH was doing almost anywhere I went, including with the media, was the first question I got asked after my presentation was about athletics. Um, we um, also actively worked here with appropriate county and state guidelines. Uh, so all of our athletics um, activities uh, follow NCAA provisions. We play in two athletic conferences, the Mountain West for football and the Big West for most everything else. Uh, they have guidelines and testing protocols, and we uh, then run all of that by the Department of Health, uh, AG, and Hyema to make sure we're authorized to do what we can do. Uh, as I think most of you know, our fall sports were first postponed and then canceled. Uh, sadly, that includes Wahine Volleyball. Um, football, um, we are one of the few teams in the country that played our entire schedule. We had only one positive test of a football player, um, in, and we tested every player, coach, and staff member three times a week throughout the season. Uh, and as you noticed over the weekend, we were uh, invited to play a bowl game. A bowl game. Uh, that's next week, and that will be our last uh, game of the season. Uh, basketball has started. Uh, we are seeing cancellation of games within the Big West. Um, we have not made decisions about any of the other spring sports. That's something uh, we do. I work with my fellow presidents of the Big West Conference, and we're meeting uh, pretty actively during this time of COVID. Uh, the result of all that you see, we're pretty proud of. Um, we post data daily. We've been highly transparent for some time. We have had only 68 university affiliated COVID-19 cases. That's across all 10 UH campuses. And that's since the beginning of the pandemic when we began to detect cases in Hawaii. Um, it's a pretty remarkable record and we're very proud of it. And it's a credit really to the diligence of our students, faculty, and staff um, who have um, followed the guidance we've provided and that's provided by um, civil authorities as well. Let me say a word about our most, uh, our critical mission of education now. Um, we were quite concerned about enrollment and you have likely read the trends uh, nationally. In fact, NPR had a story this morning, higher education enrollment is down across the nation in the range of 3%. Uh, if you look at our three universities together, 
we were actually up and you can see the numbers. Uh, Manoa and Hilo are up, uh, Manoa and West Oahu are up, Hilo's down a bit. Uh, community colleges are down, as you can see the 2.6%. That number nationally, community colleges uh, have declining headcount enrollment of about 9%. So even though it's down and we're disappointed, we're down a lot less than the national averages. Um, I think this is a credit to the outreach we did with our students. Uh, local resident enrollment is particularly up. Um, we did some media campaigns. We extended our application deadlines because families were making decisions quite late over the summer as to where they wanted to send their uh, child to school. Another bit of good news, we don't wanna just enroll students, we wanna graduate them. So um, these are some of the metrics we look at and I, I've shown you graphs as well. Um, we look at the 150% graduation rate, that's six years for the four-year schools and 100%, that would be four-year graduation rate for the universities. Uh, this is something we've made tremendous progress and we've actually received uh, national awards for at UH Manoa and we're very gratified. Um, this measures what our graduation rates uh, associated with the 2019-20 um, academic year uh, looked like. This is pretty recent data because we include summer graduations in this and we continue to make progress across most of the system. Um, as I mentioned, this has been a very high priority for all of us across the system. Uh, we were worried that we would lose students. And when we looked at the data, um, our dropout rate was not particularly high last spring, and we did continue students through to graduation. Uh, we think in large part that's, um, we think our urgent student relief fund helped, and I'll talk about the federal assistance we were able to provide to students as well. Now let me shift to finances, and I know that's of interest and concern to all of you as it is to us. Again, just kind of an update on where we, where we were. Um, we implemented a freeze almost immediately. We did this in March when we saw what was coming our way. Uh, as soon as the governor shut down tourism, uh, we knew the impact would be severe. Um, we have worked on a retirement incentive program that has not yet been implemented. Um, we took pay reductions for all of our executive managerial employees starting in November, so we led the way. I'm proud of our leadership for um, agreeing to do this ahead of the furloughs that are in process now. Um, Calvert Young, who's on our Vice President for Finance and CFO, mandated a cash preservation strategy. And this supports the Board of Regents approved operating budget for the current fiscal year. We are committed to live within our resources this year so that we could preserve our reserves to get us through the more difficult years ahead. Uh, the board has approved a uh, biennium budget uh, policy paper that lays out a multi-year approach to the difficult years ahead. The biennium budget that they approved is essentially flat. We are not so optimistic that that's what we will um, live with, uh, but we didn't want to get out in front of the governor's budget. Um, we did request substantial CIP support. We believe we are um, the best capable of executing CIP efficiently and effectively. And we can really help uh, both education and research by renewing, improving, and modernizing our facilities. This is a summary of the CARES Act. Um, it's a pretty substantial number. Uh, that $12 million that you see in tranche one is, uh, I believe now 100% given out. That went directly into the hands of students in need. Um, the second tranche provided for institutional support with some heavy constraints. Uh, that went directly into some of the COVID expenses that you've seen, particularly technology investments that will serve us well for years to come. And the third tranche um, is more flexible. It can be used for all those purposes, but it can also help us with lost revenue. So that's pretty strategic for us. The state also helped us out with their CARES funds to the tune of 11 million. That went for PPE, sanitation supplies, uh, technology and the like. And in addition to the CARES funds that everyone talks about, there are a whole range of competitive opportunities and we also helped other agencies. So there's another 31 million in CARES that's very project specific. I think I'm proudest of this reimagined workforce our community colleges led this effort. We were one of only eight states 
to successfully compete for Department of Education CARES funding. Um, the Oahu Back to Work program, contact tracing in the Tropical Medicine Clin Clinical Lab or other uh, contributions that we're making to the state's resilience from CARES. Uh, preparing for the biennium ahead, um, we are working to implement the furlough program in accord with the governor's directives and we'll need to get out instructions, we hope this week, perhaps early next week. Um, we are actively working to identify oppor opportunities for right sizing. We know we're gonna have to learn to make do with a smaller, op with a smaller infusion of general funds than we have today. Um, we have a, a pretty thoughtful, I think, um, biennium budget policy paper that lays this out. Uh, what are our priorities? What are the opportunities for um, right sizing? And frankly, what will we do to identify other revenue sources so that we're, we are not completely dependent as we are now on state general funds and tuition revenue? Um, we will follow up with a more detailed plan uh, based on uh, what we see coming out of the governor's budget that's due to be released next week. So let me close with this. Um, you know, I thank you all for serving on this committee, um, for chairing and leading it. Um, I, I wouldn't be doing this work if I didn't really believe UH is the most important contributor to the future of Hawaii. And uh, our entire leadership team, our faculty, our staff, all realize how important we are. Um, and that's why they are doing what they're doing under severe constraints, not to move just the University of Hawaii forward, but to move the entire state of Hawaii forward. So let me stop there with nine seconds to spare. Thank you, thank you, President Lesnar. Um, now, before we hear from the uh, Board of Regents followed by faculty and students, uh, let me, um, note to members that um, as you have questions for our presenters to indicate so in our chat box feature and uh, we'll address them uh, after the presentations. So let us now hear from uh, Board of Regents Chair Ben Kudo. I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Takeyama and uh, uh, Vice Chair DeCoit and the members of the Committee on Higher Education and Technology. My name is Ben Kudo. I'm the chair of the Board of Regents. Uh, your question, I guess, in your notice is what uh, have we done to prepare for the present pandemic situation at the University of Hawaii? Um, we first learned of this in, in March of uh, this year. And as soon as we learned about it, the Board of Regents uh, we're very concerned about the potential impact, both uh, in terms of operation and in terms of fiscal impact uh, to the university and its future. Uh, in preparation for that, uh, it was very difficult for us to plan what we were going to be doing uh, because it was a period of uncertainty. Some at that time predicted that the COVID situation would last only a month and that we would be out in the, out of that situation by March or April. Uh, and, and because of that uncertainty, it is very, very difficult uh, in that kind of uh, scenario to plan effectively. Your plans have to be very flexible and be able to be adjusted uh, when new data, new information on not only the COVID situation, but its related impacts are made known to you. As a result of that, um, we formed a COVID task group uh, of five uh, members of the board uh, to assist the administration in doing COVID planning for, the, for the, the near term as well as the long term. The essential to that planning was the uh, call to the administration to establish what we call a long-term vision of the University of Hawaii. We know that the fiscal impacts will not be temporary. The fiscal impacts we predict will go on for years and will get worse in the next two or three years. Uh, as a result of that, the fiscal resources that we have to maintain operations, both physical plant faculty and other uh, programs uh, will not be able to be sustained given the budget reductions that we're facing in the future. As a result of that, it was, it was uh, appropriate for us to ask administration to look hard at what the university would look like in 2033, 2030, uh, down the road. And as a result of that vision, we should develop both short-term and long-term plans and 
uh, implement certain uh, management measures to bring about efficiencies and bring about that long-term vision, whatever that might be. As a result of that, uh, the administration has been working very, very diligently at uh, gathering uh, input from the various campuses, the other stakeholders, the faculty, staff, students, et cetera, to input into this very, very complex uh, situation that we're faced with. Um, and to recommend to the board the various kinds of actions that would necessarily have to be taken. In August of this year, the board enacted a resolution so that publicly we announced that this was an emergency situation, uh, both operationally as well as fiscally, and that certain measures may be taken that were very difficult words for our audience, our stakeholders, the public to listen to, uh, such as you know, retrenchment and, and uh, reduction in, in workforce, uh, furloughs and those kinds of things. We needed to get those, those concepts out there so that people would be prepared uh, in the eventuality that those types of bridges would be crossed in the future. As a result of that resolution, which was passed in August, uh, the board set about to, again, work very closely with David and his vice presidents and others uh, to make sure that both the short-term and the long-term plan, as well as the long-term vision, uh, would come to fruition uh, in as uh, quick a time frame as possible, given the uncertainties and, and the current situation. To that end, uh, David has done a very good job at, at uh, marshalling, the, marshalling his uh, resources to get that to us. We are, we are meeting every week or more with, with the administration on how we plan for the future. Uh, David touched upon enrollment, which may be an issue that exa is exacerbated in the future. Uh, some of you may know that the academic enrollment numbers uh, nationwide is facing what we call an enrollment cliff. They call it the enrollment cliff. And that is in 2026, the number of 18 year olds across the country will drop by more than 30%. As a result of that, uh, competition for students, particularly our island students, uh, will become more acute as we predict. And therefore, keeping our enrollment numbers will be a challenge because other schools on the mainland will be uh, cherry picking our students to go to their schools to survive. Uh, so competition for students is going to be very, very difficult uh, come 2026 and thereafter. Uh, with a 30% decline in 18 year olds across the country. Uh, so we have a lot of challenges that we're facing, not only the pandemic, but other things that, were, that we were predicting and working with in terms of uh, having a very rigorous and robust enrollment management program that David has implemented uh, across all campuses and that we are now getting uh, numbers on and monitoring very closely and developing uh, management tactics that will hopefully uh, try to neutralize any adverse impact because of the cliff and uh, declining numbers across the country. And that's in a nutshell what uh, the board has done, uh, at least with regard to the pandemic thus far. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, we'll now hear from our faculty representative, uh, Rosie Vieira, who is co-chair of the uh, statewide council of faculty senate chairs and also a faculty member at UH Maui College. Professor uh, Vieira, the floor is yours. Okay, I'm trying to share my screen. Where is it? There we go. Okay. Aloha kakahiaka. Mahalo for taking a few minutes to listen to the presentation. I will highlight how the system has provided substantial support during the pandemic. Let me start by acknowledging our, our faculty's flexibility and dedication to our students and their success. Approximately 452 unduplicated headcount of faculty participated in summer professional development programs. If faculty were eligible, they received $200 stipend for an activity and up to $400 total if they participated in three activities. This was funded primarily by CARES. The response to change teaching modalities while being mindful to maintain high standards of instruction were made possible by the extraordinary quality 
of professional development opportunities offered across the system. Oops, what happened? Faculty and students were provided computers, access to Wi-Fi, headphones, Zoom support while learning from at home and on campus. Loans approximated 105, which included laptops, Wi-Fi hotspots, and computer peripherals. In spring 2020, the Learning Center, IT, and other offices issued laptops to students. The 105 number is library loans only. 121 tech support sessions by library tech tutors and librarians via live chat, phone, email, and or Zoom were made possible. Similar activities are occurring across all campuses. The use of technology and innovation has allowed our system to improvise, adapt, and overcome multiple obstacles during these challenging times. Maui College Counseling Department implemented Star Balance to become fully accessible to students during COVID. To date, more than 4,097 students, student appointments have been booked via Star Balance for a single location which highlights the demand for continuous year-round activities for students. STAR is the university's student support platform that provides electronic registration, guided pathways to take the correct courses that count towards degree completion and a robust scheduling tool that allow campus services to be available to students via multiple modalities. A full integration of campus services, such as the Learning Center, tutoring services, computer lab reservations, is ongoing to provide students seamless access to multiple services in one location. This is a system initiative. Maui College is piloting the initiative. Transitioning students to fully online platforms were made possible by the countless number of dedicated faculty. Faculty did, faculty did everything possible to support students who struggled. Online instruction often means more and not less work, including the necessity of access to instructional design professionals. The un uncertainty of budget provides us with opportunities to be innovative. Having challenging conversations, although necessary, cuts are often met with intense feelings of fear and anxiety. The need for transparent shared governance is critical. People are more accepting if they, are, if they have a clear understanding of what lies ahead. Faculty and administrators can learn from each other. Embracing virtual and hybrid, sometimes called blended learning, the benefits include reduced time spent in the classroom, immediate feedback for testing when grading tools are available, access to course materials, keeping up with the technology curve and reducing fixed costs associated with classroom only instruction. Programs across the system rely on face-to-face -to, -face to assure students' success and graduation. Studio art, automotive, fashion tech, dental hygiene, nursing, culinary, science labs, and some music courses are a few examples. In an effort to create efficient programs according to the needs of the community, the system must remain diligent and not downsize, eliminate to a point where there is when there is an increase in enrollment, we have the certificate and degrees necessary to meet the needs of our community. Campuses are pivoting to move forward and come out of this with lessons learned by responding to changing needs. Student success is the core of all we do. We all benefit from living in communities that are educated. Mahalo. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vieira. 
uh, we're now going to hear from a student representative, Renee Hutchins, who is um, chair of the UH Statewide Student Caucus, as well as a student government president at uh, Windward Community College. So I will turn it over to Renee. Let's see, are we all? Yes, I'm not ready to go. Uh, let's see, okay, I'm just making sure. Okay, there we are. Okay, okay thank perfect. you, Renee, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome, mahalo. Uh, thank you again to the chair, vice chair, and all the members of the committee, as well as our faculty and staff who are attending today. I do apologize for any background noise. I'm sadly not able to silence the animals in the area, but I will try my best to kind of move past that. Um, but to start, um, I think I wanted to highlight today, especially kind of coming from the student perspective, um, mostly the difficulties and also some surprising positives and successes of kind of learning amidst the pandemic and just mostly learning from home and fully online. Um, some of the difficulties that were kind of most relevant and kind of were talked about in the other presentations was the overall lack of technology for many students, such as lacking having your own personal computer or having computers at all um, within your home. Similar with having internet connection and overall bandwidth, um, especially having struggles of maybe having multiple users on one network at a time. If you and all your family members are also in school, if your children are in school, and if your family might be working from home also, there is that struggle of just overall having weak internet. Um, I do want to mention, though, that a lot of campuses were able to, um, with a lot of the CARES funding and also just personal campus budgets, to provide some sort of technology, whether it be loaner laptops or even loaner hotspots for students to use to still attend classes and get things done. Um, I think overall, another difficulty could be that students experience a major conf conflict of priorities within their own lives, um, having to balance completing courses and getting good grades in those, and also maybe managing your own children's studies for parents or for students who are also parents, which we do have a good population of, especially at the CCs. Um, and I think also just working from home, if you might have jobs outside of the school, and also maybe being essential workers. I do know a lot of students who work part time, uh, maybe being grocery store workers who had to worry about that in the middle of March. Um, so I think kind of moving past that could have also been a difficulty. And I think overall, the priority of maintaining good health during this time can be a bit strenuous for students on top of everything else. And I think too with studying online, especially with the major switch that happened in the middle of the spring semester of being in historically in-person classes to now being fully online, I think a lot of students, especially our Kapuna students, did experience that learning period of taking all in-person classes and having online classes for the very first time. And especially with the pressure and kind of the time restrictions of having to learn quick and learn fast, um, a lot of students did experience that difficulty at first. And similar for faculty too, I do know of a lot of students who experience somewhat of an intermission in their courses, um, kind of right around the time of our spring 2020 spring break, where a lot of faculty had to deal with that switch of I've only ever taught in person classes before, I don't know how to make things online. Um, but I think once that period of maybe a week and a half of everybody just getting used to it, once that had passed, um, things really did go smoothly for the spring semester. And I'm glad to hear that in terms of statistics, a lot of people did end up making it through the semester and we did didn't have a high dropout rate. In terms of emotional and mental health, I think this is something that everybody who's attending today is always aware of, that students do, especially in higher education, struggle with maintaining emotional and mental health with the strenuous duties of being a student. And so I think a lot of folks did struggle with losing that on campus and face-to-face -face access of maybe using the mental health facilities on campuses um, and dealing with overall isolation of having to be entirely from home. Um, but I do think since spring, things have gotten better for a lot of students in terms of getting access to some of the resources, whether on campus or outside of campus, to get help in that area. And I think overall, there is the worry about um, connecting with on-campus offices. This wasn't too big of a huge worry um, from what I've known, but I think there is for a lot of the, um, especially incoming students who are brand new to school, have recently applied, always having the struggle of, I need to connect with on-campus officials. I don't really know how to do that, what changes have been made. So I think a lot of um, campuses did make well use of their websites to really make clear to folks of how to get in contact with the offices they need to connect with and just making sure that there's not a huge barrier in that way. Um, some positives and successes of studying um, during the pandemic do include that communicating with other students has been much easier than ever. I think emailing, emailing each other more than ever and really building those critical netiquette skills has been a lot easier. 
Um, same for faculty, I think the online office hours issue has usually been solved with it being more predictable and consistent of when I can meet my professors. And also similar for critical campus support services going entirely online. I think once you got past that initial barrier of who do I contact, what are they doing, how can I reach them, um, it really did become easier to make appointments and get help when we needed it. And then lastly, I just wanna kind of highlight some things that many students are really appreciative for this year. I think definitely the urgent student relief funding and the CARES funding, um, which came through, really did help a lot of students, especially those who might've lost jobs or lost significant hours during the pandemic. It really did provide significant relief in terms of tuition and groceries and just regular funding. And I think also within the system, the ability to withdraw courses much later into the semester than usual, and the ability to have a credit non-credit option in terms of not having an impact to GPA and having that option to make classes credit or non-credit once you've seen your grades. And I think lastly, just having a lot of the emerging scholarship programs or tuition forgiveness programs that have come out for either some courses or some programs has been a great way to pull in students and also ensure that students who have been attending regularly are able to still stay in school. Mahalo for your time and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Renee. That uh, student perspective is exactly what we wanted to learn about. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now, before we open it up to questions from all members, I uh, want to uh, let everyone know that we uh, solicited questions prior to the hearing, and we did receive four questions from members. And so I'll begin by uh, reading off those questions. Thank you, Representative Capella. And um, we will allow our presenters to, to answer them. Uh, first question is, does the university have the staffing and resources it needs to ensure campus safety as the pandemic continues? Uh, President Lasner, let's start with yeah, you. I'll play, I'll, at least for these, uh, if you don't mind, I'll, I can play traffic cop for the questions and responses. Um, so yes, we actually feel pretty comfortable about this. Um, the CARES uh, money that we received, uh, some of it was limited to this purpose. Uh, we also got extraordinary help from the state and I wanna correct a misstatement earlier. Our PPE was actually provided to us directly from HIEMA from their CARES money. Uh, the other money was used for um, some reimbursements of expenses and IT upgrades, but not PPE. Um, we, we feel um, like we're in pretty good shape. Uh, most of the campuses still have a bit of tranche three left, if not tranche two. Uh, a lot of our uh, materials and supplies have been pre-purchased for the spring. So we, we believe we'll be okay to get through the spring and we actually don't have an emergency appropriation request in from UH for COVID specifically. Um, watching what's happening in DC, uh, it looks, promising that if the stimulus bill that they are talking about passes attached to the budget, um, while it does not look good for state and local governments, it does look good for education, uh, both K-12 and higher ed, not as much as was requested, but you know, comparable or even more than was in the last CARES bill. So we're okay. okay thank you. Um, Unless anyone, any of the other presenters have anything to add, um, I'll go on to the next question. Uh, UH administrators have proposed dramatic budget cuts to manage projected revenue reductions, some of which have included elimination of entire departments and programs or consolidation of some uh, degree programs. These efforts were widely opposed by the university community. Is UH still pursuing these cuts? And how will university stakeholders, including professors and students be consulted as the budget planning process moves forward. Um, okay, let me start and then I'm gonna ask um, more of my colleagues to, to weigh in. Um, our assumption is that uh, <laughs> the uh, state budget deficit is real. The general funded programs will have to learn how to um, survive with reduced general funds. Uh, the university relies on general funds for ballpark 60% of our general operations with the other part coming in from um, tuition. And then we have auxiliaries which tend to be relatively self-supporting in research. Um, so if there's a substantial cut in our general funds and I know you're all watching that as is the governor and we've been briefed on his financial plan, uh, we need to find ways to make do with, with less. 
and that means doing less. Um, I um, maybe I would just phrase things a little differently. Every change that is proposed is opposed by whomever it affects, but it doesn't mean that the whole university community opposes every change. And I think within the university, there is pretty wide recognition that the budget crisis is, is real and that something has to change, but there is opposition specifically once we make a particular suggestion. Um, I think the, um, what you have heard from the university community is natural and it's to be expected. And it's the result of the openness and transparency with which this process is uh, being led in each of our major units with open meetings. Well, let me just stop there. And um, what I will do is ask each of our four academic leaders uh, to share how it works on their campus because everybody's doing it a little bit differently uh, to fit within their unit. So let me start with Provost Michael Bruno from UH Manoa and maybe just a, a minute or so. Sure, thank you, David. And aloha chair and uh, committee members, thank you for everything you continue to do to support the university. Um, so we've been meeting basically nonstop since the summer with faculty, students, um, admin and administrators, as well as staff. Um, let me just summarize those meetings and give you a sense of the number of uh, different meetings we've been having. And I, I will say that as a result of these meetings, many of the changes that we are talking about have actually come from the bottom up, from, from the faculty to the chairs and, and thereby to the deans. We've held two uh, two-hour town halls with the Manoa community. Each of those were attended by around 1,000 participants. Uh, and we fielded questions from all participants. We've held to date a total of 56, that's five, six, one-hour meetings with faculty and staff from individual departments. We've held 14, a total of 14 one-hour meetings with department chairs, that's about 100 department chairs at Manoa. We've held meetings, uh, three in total with ASUH, uh, our representative student body, undergraduate student body, uh, three separate meetings with our GSO, the graduate student body. Um, I've added representatives from each of those organizations to what we call the Provost Council which meets at least monthly. Um, we've also met every other week with all of the consultative bodies. That includes representatives from UPA, HGEA, UPW, ASUH, GSO, our Kualii Council, the representative body of Manoa for our Native Hawaiian community, the UH Staff Senate and the SEC every other week since October. We've Thank you, um, I'm, I'm not gonna cut you short, but we do wanna leave time for the other um, uh, responses. So please uh, proceed if uh, the next uh, campus yep. up. Okay. Um, I'm done. Okay. Briefly, if you could, thank you. Okay, um, Maynette Benham from UH West Oahu. Aloha mai, thank you for allowing me a, a moment to share with you at UH West Oahu since March, since the pandemic hit, uh, campus leadership and staff has worked uh, very hard both to maximize the health and safety of our campus community and to address the economic impacts uh, on our educative work. We have, uh, since the faculty returned in the fall, uh, took uh, several weeks to acc acclimate to our new normal. And then we immediately went into work groups and a campus representative task force uh, to address the anticipated reductions. I just wanna make note that everything that we have done, all the data that we have used, all the reports and all the docu uh, documentation is available to the general public on our webpage. Just go to our homepage and you'll see 
the Pu'el planning process, and uh, you could actually access everything that we've done. Now, currently, what we are doing is taking a look at how we are going to implement strategies that are targeted uh, to meet the identified reductions, as well as uh, initiate new and strength-oriented uh, revenue-generating endeavors. Uh, so that, in a, in a nutshell, uh, Chair Takayama uh, is what we're doing. Thank you, Chancellor. Uh, Yui Chilo? Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Takayama and representatives. We reinstituted our long range budget planning committee in July and that group has been meeting weekly. It is a broadly based committee that has both administrators, faculty and student representation. They have looked at the data about uh, various programs on campus. They've also looked at various qualitative factors in terms of which programs serve the greatest number of native Hawaiians and which programs meet very specific community needs. We have done full campus Zoom sessions open to anyone who wants to participate where the leadership is answering questions. We have an online uh, portal to which people can submit suggestions for um, budget reductions. And then when we have identified departments that are most likely going to be affected, the Vice Chancellor for, uh, for Academic Affairs and I have met with each of those units to brainstorm um, solutions and paths forward. We have had um, a number of uh, discussions across the various units of the campus, both individually and en masse with the campus. And we are also posting a number of things on our website, uh, some of which is behind the password wall for just the campus community at this point, and some of which is public. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to give an opportunity to um, our faculty and student representatives to, to hear from them as well. And, and I, I guess the question is, uh, is always, are you are you truly being consulted or are you being talked at? So, um, Here, uh, Professor Vieira. Uh, uh, um, Erica LaCroix for the community colleges. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, much like my colleagues, we started with very large open forum meetings, both um, to be held at the individual campuses by their chancellors, but then also by me with the individual campuses. And those two have been attended by um, hundreds of people. And those are open to everyone, including um, when they're announced to students as well. We'll continue those. We then asked each campus to come up with recommendations that we could uh, bundle up into different ideas while also looking at all of our performance data in terms of how our programs perform, uh, what the demand is and then came up with some recommendations where we put together work groups to help us identify what are the changes we can make in these different areas of programmatic alignment, consolidation of programs in some cases, um, and centralization of services for students in other cases. So it's these work groups that are coming up with the ideas for us to be able to implement. And those groups will continue to do their work as we move into January. We also have everything posted online for the public to see with a white paper that lists out all of these different ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Professor uh, Vieira, please. Thank you. I, um, the opportunities to communicate um, are tremendous, uh, especially on Maui. Um, I am the co-chair of the All-Campus um, Council of Academic Senate Chairs, and we meet very regularly. People have every opportunity possible given to them to work with the system. Thank you. Uh, Renee, did you have anything you wanted to add? I think definitely there's always been a lot of opportunities for students to at least sit in a lot of the critical meetings in terms of budget changes happening in each individual campus and just overall changes that are happening within the system as um, everybody else has mentioned meeting with ASUH representatives and GSO reps and I think even recently within caucus we recently had President Lassner join us on our past Saturday meeting to kind of share some updates and just have an open conversation of changes that are coming in and some thoughts that are happening within the system so definitely a lot of opportunities um, I don't know 
know if I can speak exactly for each individual campus about how exactly it's being done, but I think definitely the invites are always there to hop into faculty senate meetings and the budget committee meetings. Um, whether they get taken all the time or not, I'm not too certain, but I do know that it's always been an open invitation for students. Thank you, Renee. Um, let's move on to the third question, uh, which is throughout the state and country, sexual and domestic violence cases have skyrocketed. Uh, according to POW Violence, uh, UH Manoa's uh, anti-violence organization, um, sexual and domestic violence incidents have also increased at UH. How is UH responding to this? And moreover, is the university ensuring that organizations like POW Violence has the have the resources they need? Um, maybe we can start with Provost Bruno, UH Manoa. Uh, actually, if I can, uh, Vice President Govea looks okay. over this area. Is that okay? Okay. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much for the question. Uh, we reached out to our Title IX coordinators and advocacy programs regarding their recent experience with domestic violence situations on our campuses. And consistent with what we are seeing in our communities, some of our campuses have seen an increase in reports of instances of domestic violence. Um, interestingly, this increase in reports have been primarily from our faculty members reporting to our Title IX offices on behalf of students. Uh, we believe the increase in faculty reporting is a direct result of strong relationships with their respective Title IX offices, as well as increased training and outreach efforts that have been conducted and provided by the university over the past few years. Um, additionally, we are continuing to receive self-reports of domestic violence. Uh, we are actually kind of encouraged to see this because many of us um, are remote learning and there's lots of virtual services. And so uh, you would think there would be a drop in self-reporting, um, but with increased virtual hours and greater um, resources spent on making ourselves available to students, um, and employees who are experiencing instances of domestic violence, we are encouraged to see that the self-reporting numbers um, are still coming in. Uh, I should say we have very committed staff who are trained and cognizant of the national and emerging local data on this front. Um, the university supports a confidential advocacy program um, across all of their campuses and for Oahu, um, it's, it's all staffed by all of our Oahu campuses receive services from three full-time advocates. Um, and this includes things like safety planning, DV education, navigational support through various off-campus systems, institutional advocacy, assistance in developing creative campus support measures, and the list is kind of go goes on. Uh, we also have for our neighbor island campuses, strong relationships with community advocacy programs to provide the same services. So we are absolutely committed to ensuring that these um, services are available to our students, employees, and campus communities. And uh, we are encouraged to see um, that they are actually being um, utilized. Okay, thank you. Um, any of the other presenters have anything else to add? Uh, if not, let's move on to the fourth and final question, uh, pre-question. Um, pre-hearing pre question. Uh, and it relates to the uh, state's economic diversification efforts and overall economic recovery. Um, is the UH prioritizing programs that'll enhance our long-term economic diversification and sustainability like climate change mitigation, public health innovation and regenerative agriculture? And um, if, you, if you don't mind, I'll take this and I actually have a few slides, but I'll, I'll go through them quickly and then I will include them um, in, in the materials that we send as follow-up. Um, this is something that we've thought about a lot um, because grounded, and I shared the vision with you, uh, my last slide earlier uh, was really um, to identify how we're prioritizing as we go through this challenging budget situation. So we really have four priorities that we identified, including the ones you mentioned. So let me just say um, a couple words about each and then you'll have the slides to review. One is that um, we know we need to get more of Hawaii's people 
into and through post-secondary education, certificates, associate degrees, bachelor's degrees, graduate degrees. And um, I was in a session with um, Carl Bonham from UHERO yesterday, and he emphasized the importance of investing in human capital through education. Uh, this is not just vocational training. This is also a broad, thoughtful, liberal education uh, that enables students to thrive and our graduates to thrive. The second is that we need a strong focus on uh, educating Hawaii residents for living wage Hawaii jobs. Um, I just listed three categories here. Uh, these also align with the talent roadmap. Um, I think as everybody knows, um, when we educate our own residents to fill the jobs that we need here, it's better for the employers because the uh, employees stick. And it's also better for our community and we're committed in, in much of those federal funds and also some private funds that we've raised are focused on workforce development to help people who have been uh, stricken by unemployment to help move them forward into other kinds of careers where there are jobs. Third is the economic sectors. This is the area you specifically highlighted. These are the areas that we've identified um, and without going into detail, because I know time is short, I will say that we believe these are areas where Hawaii has both a competitive, a potential competitive advantage. Um, also, we either have capability or can grow it. These are activities that can both um, elevate Hawaii to create a better future for us here, but they can also create segments of a traded economy. Um, I will just pick because it was in the list food um, I think we need um, what I'd call sustainable um, uh, individual agriculture. That's uh, families that want to grow food, uh, that want to increase production on their own land. But we also need to keep an eye on uh, agriculture and aquaculture as job creators. And that's going to take, um, in addition to growing food for ourselves, looking at um, export crops and high value products. Um, lastly, the area of tourism and you know, that's a conversation for a bigger day, but um, our sense is that no one thing is going to replace tourism. We need to be investing in all these areas. This is all encompassed in our uh, Board of Regents approved biennium budget paper. Last comment is our research enterprise. Uh, it's often overlooked. Uh, this is last year, $450 million in extramural funding came in. That's other people's money that UH faculty and administrators bring into the state, creating jobs and economic impact throughout the islands. We've identified our areas of strength that you can see here that we need to continue to invest in. We've also identified areas where we believe there are opportunities for growth. Uh, that is essentially federal money, uh, either on the table or coming that we can position ourselves to compete for uh, better. And, and as I think everyone knows, no community has really been able to develop into an economic powerhouse um, without a strong research university at its core. Okay. Thank you, uh, President Lesnar. At this point, we're going to turn it over to member questions. And I've asked uh, Vice Chair Linda Coit ahead of time to please monitor the um, chat box. So uh, Vice Chair DeCoit, who do we have lined up? Thank you, Chair. Uh, first, uh, and thank you guys for the presentation. First, we have Representative Peruso. Um, if you go ahead with your question, please. Sure. Uh, thank you for um, that presentation. It was very helpful. Um, I've, my question is for President Lasner, and it's about um, the research training and revolving funds. Um, and as you just mentioned, um, the $450 million dollars um, it's my understanding that about 12.5% of that um, goes to UH Manoa's chancellor's or now the provost's office. Um, and I think there have been proposals floated by faculty to um, use that $56 million to um, pay $30 million in electricity and $26 million in uh, graduate research, um, you know, salaries. Um, assistant salaries. And I was wondering if you would consider that use of, of those monies in that way, or if there's some obstacle or barrier that I'm unaware of. Um, let me um, start, and we also have Vice President Sirmos with us, but the, 
the 450 million includes a, um, an indirect cost, which when it is paid to UH becomes that RTRF. And there is a distribution mechanism such that 25% of it stays at the system, pays for expenses such as RCUH, which facilitate that research. The other 75% tends to go back to the unit that is Manoa, Hilo, West Oahu, and so forth. And um, at Manoa, which is the most complicated and where most of that money goes, of that 75% that goes back, only 25% stays with the vice chancellor for research. The other 50% goes to the deans of the unit that generated that. So SOAS, social science, et cetera, Jabsum Cancer Center, and that money then gets used to support the actual research that goes on within those programs. So startup funds are one of the most common. Uh, Jabsum pays some electricity bill with it and so forth. Um, I'm not actually familiar, and I don't know, Michael, if you're familiar with that specific proposal or Vasilis. I am not. It's the first I hear of it. Uh, there is a lot of uh, discussion about RTRF paying utilities. And as the president said, uh, uh, campuses do pay, especially the Kakako campus uh, pays a lot of their utilities, repair and maintenance out of RTRF. Uh, also, a lot of facilities off the Manoa campus pay for some of their infrastructure using RTRF. The majority of that RTRF is used for startup funds salaries. Uh, we have a lot of researchers on salaries. This is soft money. So there is a big part of that. And then there are fees like the RCUH management fees and, uh, and others. Uh, we are very fortunate to have our RTRF and we distribute it, I think, in a very wise manner. Uh, you've seen when uh, the legislature returned the RTRF back in uh, late 90s to the university, our production from $220 million pretty much jumped in the, by the end of the beginning of uh, 2012, 2011, up to $400 plus million. So I think we're using our RTRF, I believe, in, in a good way. David, the only thing I would add to that is uh, that our units, particularly our research intensive units, do budget for the use of RTRF to support uh, their facilities, uh, including their energy intensive facilities. So in fact, uh, several units use their RTRF already to pay for utilities costs and for other items related directly to research. Mr. Okay. Um, okay, moving on to the next question. It's coming from Rep Wakimoto and her question is, uh, about positions, has UH been able to identify the positions that protect the health and safety of those on the campuses? And if those positions are funded with special funds and how would they be ma maintained? So um, I think I'll take that generally. And then if there's something more specific, we can, um, you know, we, we may have people who can answer. So um, as mentioned uh, at the very beginning, we have literally frozen every UH vacancy at the University of Hawaii. So anyone who wants to fill a position, um, that request has to come up from the campus to me. And I can tell you that um, the, the chancellors are extremely cautious about what they ask for. We know we have to do with less. And um, I tend to grill people if it doesn't look obvious to me that this is something that needs to be done. And the one uh, request that I have never questioned is any request to fulfill uh, a security position. Uh, last year, the legislature swept a number of security vacancies. Um, so we are doing our best to maintain with the bodies we have. As some of you know, um, we are prohibited from contracting externally. So this is a real challenge for us. Um, we have not gotten the support we've requested in general for campus security, um, but we do the best we can with, with what we have. Um, but these absolutely are prioritized. Uh, pretty much anything relating to health and safety uh, is a top priority. 
as are uh, positions that are essential to the priority areas that, that, that we've laid out for you. Um, really quick, so President Lasner, you mentioned the security guards. I'm assuming that they're separate from the, the security and safety of the campus is different from the personnel who are um, keeping the campus's health safety, I guess, clean, cleans and uh, Okay, so, so was, you know, yeah. you know, with COVID, um, those those positions to identify specifically the the health and that type of safety, like gotcha. how the elementary so the DOE is doing there. Yep. So so actually, um, those positions are mostly general funded. Uh, we absolutely preserve them, and in fact, um, this was an acceptable use of CARES funds. So we have invested more in campus health and safety using the CARES funds that are available including in mental health, not just physical health. Mm -hmm. So um, this is an area where, you know, you know, we always want more, but the CARES funding has been really helpful to us. So beyond that, how will this be maintained? How, how will this be <laughs> maintained? It will be one of many, you know, we'll have to see if the pandemic calms down, maybe we won't need the extra help that we've put in place during the pandemic period. But we have, for example, at Manoa, we have a campus response team. Um, we have a campus response team that answers these things. Sorry, my landline's going off. Um, that answers these things, and that's funded with CARES. But hopefully, we won't need a COVID response team once the pandemic passes. Hopefully, by fall. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you, Chair. You're welcome. Uh, moving on to um, and next question uh, from Rep Kobayashi. You can go ahead with your question. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair. So the um, I'm just looking for some clarification, actually, on um, relationship or uh, lack thereof uh, between your anticipated, I guess, you'd aggregate demand for the product uh, versus um, our efforts to adjust capacity of the product. So there's um, um, there are comments made about. Um, uh, what we all know that there will be a reduction in 18 year olds. And uh, the response to that was that we should be um, uh, trying to maintain uh, enrollment at a certain level uh, in the face of that by competing with our other firms. So uh, we gotta make sure that people come into Walmart and don't go to Costco. So that we have a, um, a need to maintain enrollment at a certain level, despite uh, demographics of the country changing in a big way. Um, one objective you could say for the university would be to provide quality, affordable education for those that seek it. Um, and I, I guess another one as was brought out would be that we would, um, we would try to maintain the aggregate demand for the education product um, in the face of demographics that say that that should fall. And at the same time, um, on the other side of that, we have uh, um, comments made that, um, and uh, very clearly that um, we're not downsizing, um, we're actually using a different word, we're right-sizing uh, to um, uh, make it the right size. So um, the demographics dictate that the right size is smaller, but um, rather than uh, trying to um, adjust to that reality. Um, and um, there is an effort to say, well, we want a bigger piece of the, the smaller pie nationally, um, competing against our other educational uh, institutions around the country that are all have the same objective as ours to educate um, our young people to um, ensure that we can maintain a certain level here, even though um, the, the demographics of the, the country um, do not support that. So um, is, there, um, is there a problem with downsizing uh, to meet the reduction in anticipated enrollment as opposed to um, trying to maintain a certain level of infrastructure to, um, for, you know, for um, reasons that I think are fairly obvious uh, in the face of uh, likely declining enrollment? And that's really what I was looking for clarification on. So I, I think um, I'll use the word right-sized 
because there is growth in some areas and there is shrinkage in other areas. So um, Manoa experienced growing enrollment, uh, UH West Oahu experienced growing enrollment. So this is not a uniform trend. Um, the report that uh, Chair Kudo referred to, in fact, the latest version of it comes out of the WICHI organization, was just released this week. Um, Hawaii has one of the lower drops in uh, high school graduation graduates expected over the next decade. But um, I think there's also an equity and social justice piece to this, that if the expectation of the state is that people should go away to the mainland to go to college, then we're closing off opportunity for people who can't afford to go off to the mainland and go to college. Um, we're the lowest cost provider because we're supported uh, by the state government because of the positive impact. And, and you know, I, I went over the slide very quickly, but it's in Hawaii's best interest to have a more educated population. So the estimate out of Georgetown, one of the best sources is that about 70% of the new jobs coming up require some post-secondary education. Right now, when you look at the number of our population and the last time I looked, and I'm sure I'll be within a percent or two, um, about 48% of Hawaii's working age adults have some post-secondary education. So this is a sad mismatch for Hawaii. It means that our residents are less prepared for the jobs that our employers are gonna need. And that's why we focused on that as a priority. So um, it's often said that public higher education is both a public good and a private good. And this is why um, college graduates earn on average about a million, a bachelor's degree is worth about a million dollars in lifetime earnings more. That's more taxes that are paid into the state. A college graduate is less likely to be incarcerated at public expense, less likely to draw on social services at public expense, pays more taxes, is healthier. Um, their children are more likely to go to college. So it's got an intergenerational effect. Um, I, I'm sorry if I'm a little bit on a soapbox, but this is pretty much what I you know, devoted my life to. And I, I truly believe we've got to get more people into higher education. So even if our high school population drops, right now the number, and again, I'm gonna be within a percent or two, is that only 56% of our public high school graduates go into post-secondary education. So we're setting ourselves up for, to be an unsuccessful society if we don't begin to turn these things around. And that's what Hawaii P20 Partnerships for Education is incredibly, um, successful in working at the juncture, but we've got a lot more to do to move that needle with the DOE. So, thank you, thank you President. Um, thank you. Representative Kobayashi, thank you, but I think we need to move on now. Yeah. We're running out of time, but uh, I remember all members, this is an informational briefing. So we'll have four months to debate the pluses and minuses of the UH uh, in, the, in the months ahead. So, uh, Vice Chair. Thank you, Chair. Okay, so next question coming from Majority Leader. Question is whether UH is coordinating with state's workforce development councils to identify, target, and develop retraining, skilling up efforts. And do we have aggregate numbers of residents taking advantage of these training opportunities during this pandemic time? And uh, we can just keep the answer really short and to the point, please, if you guys will. So why don't I just do this rather than, I don't know if Tammy's on or Erica, but let me just say, yes, we absolutely coordinate with the State's Workforce Development Council. Um, we are a member, uh, but uh, as importantly, the large grant that I mentioned, the $13 million grant, that was absolutely done in close coordination with the Workforce Development Council, which had to... Um, identify our proposal as the proposal from the state of Hawaii. It wasn't a set aside to UH. Um, and we can absolutely get you numbers on all of the programs we have. Um, most of this is being led out of our uh, community college vice president's office. So um, Vice President LaCroix and Associate Vice President Tammy Chum, Chun are uh, on point for this. And we'll follow up with um, Majority Leader. Okay, thank you, President Nessner. Um, so I have a question. Um, 
uh, real simple. What what are the impacts of closing a lost stadium uh, in regards to our <laughs> Boy, you're fast. <laughs> That just leaked for those of you who aren't following about uh, within the last half hour or so. Um, we are, uh, it's pretty serious to us. Um, so if we can't have fans there, we need to identify another place to play for fall 2021. Um, so it's going to be a real challenge. Um, we will have to continue to talk with the stadium authority, the new project isn't expected to be online for um, a minimum of three years. And you know the project isn't really out of the starting gate yet. So um, this is um, a grave concern to us, grave concern. And we're, we're gonna Mr. have to- Mr. If I could ask uh, President Lesnar, um, you know, since we're not allowing spectators at games anyway, couldn't you relate, couldn't you relocate to someplace like Cook Field or even a high school stadium where we have regularly televised um, yes. yes, That's absolutely one of the options we'll be looking at. Um, we're looking at our campus facilities first and the possibility of adding some number of spectators. Our, um, our expectation is that we'll be able to have at least some spectators by next fall. I mean, I, I tend to be bullish about our community's ability to respond, to follow public health guidance and you know, I'm, I'm very upbeat about the um, vaccines. It looks like, you know, for sure we'll have two and likely three in play. Um, and I think as many people, this is my guess, as many people uh, who are willing to be vaccinated will be vaccinated by the beginning of football season. Thank you, okay. President. If, if you can, can you um, follow up on a side note with us? What is the financial impacts? Um, and I know you probably don't have it offhand, but can you Definitely. send us something? <laughs> Um, and then I, I know, okay. and then and a, a really quick question. Um, as you know, TMT has been on hot, heavy issue. Um, going forward with, with cutbacks and so forth, I think my bigger concern is social distancing. Um, while people are passionate on both sides of the spectrum, what is the mission going forward in TMT and how do we address that situation and keeping everybody safe? Uh, can you say a little more? I'm not sure I fully understand. So, so in regards to TMT and its close measures, uh, as we have protests that mm -hmm. are lined up on the mountain, you know, we've had questions on security and so forth. And I believe for most of us, security was necessary because we wanted to keep the social distancing as well as safety there. Is there any new um, measures going forward on your folks' behalf or preventive measures that they would say? Um, well, there's no imminent plan uh, right now for TMT to restart construction. Uh, UH is not generally involved in the security measures. That tends to be a mix of state and county. So I don't have a definitive answer. Um, I think the, you know, many of the protesters have been highly respectful and I would assume that um, if there were protests in the future, that protesters would attempt to do their best to um, maintain the health and safety of, of everyone. Um, but thank you, thank you President. Uh, okay, um, Chair, all you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, I appreciate the, the chance to ask a couple questions of my own. Um, and these are sort of uh, nitty gritty budget reduction type questions. So. Uh, President Lasner, I, I know that you've, um, under your administration, the uh, position of chancellor at UH Manoa has been abolished and you've been working to administer uh, the UH Manoa in, in conjunction with uh, Provost uh, Bruno. Uh, and this relationship, I take it, has worked well for the past, how, how long has it been, a year? Uh, it has actually been three years. Three years, sorry. Yeah, um, and, I, you know, you know I think most of us on campus believe it's working well, but there are definitely, um, in particular, some faculty who oppose the change from the start and continue to oppose the change. Uh, I think that's to be expected, but um, I, I believe we brought greater coherence to um, working together as a system. Um, and I think we've achieved um, pretty substantial savings, certainly in the millions of dollars 
associated with both that initial reorganization and then the follow-on reorganization. Uh, we call it phase two that's um, out for consultation with all of the governance groups and unions right now. And we hope to put that in place and uh, by July. And that fleshes out the structures under the provost who has now become for the first time the true academic leader of Manoa. Okay, well, thank you. And um, I know that, well, and, and given that this relationship has worked um, well for the past three years, I, I note that um, there are several of your vice presidents, for example, in the areas of research and administration who duplicate titles at the um, Manoa, uh, at the vice chancellor level. For example, we have a vice chancellor for research and a vice chancellor for um, administration slash finance. So is it your plan to um, adopt the same approach and eliminate those Manoa vice chancellor positions at the potential savings of however millions of dollars there that might be? So we've actually laid all of that out in phase two. So let me um, use a couple terms. We have full system-wide vice presidents. So those are vice presidents who their scope is for all 10 campuses and the system administration. So that's vice president for legal affairs. There is no other legal affairs office. Um, vice president Young is the CFO for the entire UH system, but each unit also has somebody who manages the finances uh, on a much more operational basis. So um, Calvert, for example, looks over the whole, uh, the totality of UH. And then we have a, in the new organization, our working title is chief business officer who just looks over the Manoa finances. We have centralized a lot of the operational functions under vice president Govea. So there is a vice president for administration. And the word we use there is a hybrid vice president. So she has some system wide functions and some Manoa functions. Same for Vice President Yoshimi for IT. There is no camp Manoa campus IT organization. So he looks after the system matters, but also the Manoa matters. Research is, I think, the only area where we have people with duplicative titles. We have a Vice President for Research and Innovation, Vice President Sirmos, who's there uh, with us today and spoke earlier. We also have uh, a Vice Chancellor for Research who is, uh, that position is being retitled as a vice provost for research. Um, the distinction is that Vice President Sirmos oversees all of the infrastructure associated with bringing in processing those $450 million. And I should say growing, this morning we were up 20% year over year. So it's looking good. Uh, most, some of us look at those numbers every day. Um, he also has uh, the portfolio for economic development and innovation statewide. The vice provost for research at Manoa is really focused on helping the Manoa units, faculty, graduate students, undergraduate students, all participate actively in research so that we can be a highly successful um, R1 research university, which we're quite proud of. So I wish we had different words. Vice President Sirmos knows, I, I tried to figure out if we could put a different word in the titles so that we wouldn't get asked this question. The roles are really distinct, but the titles make it appear to overlap. Well, I, I appreciate your uh, explanation, President Lasner, but it still seems to me that if you are able to adopt both the system-wide administrative duties as well as, and I, I understand that you make many of the, some of the day-to-day -day decisions in, in some even minute detail, that if you can adopt this approach, that um, it, why it could not be um, translated to the vice chancellor slash vice president level as well. But you know that's a discussion for um, uh, another day. Um, my second question has to do with the, the fact that, um, as you mentioned, enrollments go up and down. Um, we have 10 UH campuses. Six of them are o on Oahu. And um, my question is, is there any thought, you know, each of our campuses except for Manoa is, is led by a chancellor and all of the um, accompanying staff that, that go with it. Is there any thought to maybe consolidating administration 
of a smaller campus with a larger one to, again, as I say, um, try and achieve some administrative savings um, at that level, at least on Oahu. So um, I'm gonna ask, you know, we've talked about this and, and to, we didn't see any great opportunities with Manoa, which has a different mission, you know, of being a research university. It has different teaching loads. It has different um, faculty uh, salary pay scales as well as the other uh, campuses. Um, UH Hilo and UH West Oahu are um, similar in mission, general mission, but distinctive in serving their regional populations. Um, some of you may recall that actually uh, those two used to be headed by a single chancellor, but both have grown since then and have developed their own administrative infrastructure. But let me ask um, Vice President LaCroix, who oversees all seven community colleges, because she's uh, pushing on uh, opportunities for achieving savings across, in particular, the seven community colleges that share a mission. Um, and, it, and it's not just the savings. I think as we're looking at the, this right sizing, we're also looking at how we can do better uh, by ensuring that even smaller campuses and the people who are served by them have access to more services and opportunities. So Erica. Yes, so I will say we are looking at those options in how we reorganize ourselves. Um, we would like to see us take a stronger UHCC uh, approach to uh, making sure we have strong alignment of our programs and we we replicate a lot of services across the seven that we want to make sure that we can centralize where, where we see fit, but the administrative functions also fall within that bucket. So those are conversations we're having as well. Thank you. Um, you know, I don't have any other questions, but I, I do wanna, and it is um, very close to 1130. So at this time, I do want to thank all of our uh, uh, participants, especially our faculty representative, Professor Vieira, and our student representative, Renee Hutchins, for participating. And um, this is a discussion, as I mentioned, that will continue for the weeks and months ahead. So mahalo to all of you for participating, and I'm looking forward to a, a tremendously successful uh, 2021 and good riddance to 2020. Thank you all. Mahalo. Aloha. Aloha.